morning and welcome to South Crest for our summer series, Minor League. At this time, I would like to introduce our starting lineup. For the home team, we have at pitcher number three, Amos. At catcher, number five, Micah. On first base, number four, Obadiah. Starting on second base, number nine, Haggai. Third base, number six, Nahum. Our shortstop today is number one, Hosea. Playing left field, number two, Joel. The center fielder, number 11, Malachi. At right field, number 10, Zechariah. Our designated hitter for today is number eight, Zephaniah. And in the bullpen, we have number seven, Habakkuk. Let's play ball. Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Well, that's actually pretty good. Pretty good for, for midsummer there. I hope you guys are having a great day. We are so excited that you are here as we continue in our series called Minor Leagues. Before we get too far along, I want to thank John and Joshua for preaching the last two weeks as my family was away. They both did a great job, and it's a blessing to know you have people who can step up and serve in that capacity when you are out of pocket. So I appreciate that. Um, as we're looking at these minor prophets, I love what Joshua said last week when he started off, that this group of books is something that we really don't study in our own personal quiet times usually. It's, it's one of those things that we just get to and we're like, I don't know if I really want to be here right now, right? I mean, a lot of us love the New Testament. We love reading the stories about Jesus. We don't even mind some of the Old Testament, right? David and Goliath, some of those stories we find in Samuels and Kings and Chronicles. We, we like those stories. But when it gets to other areas of the Bible, it can be not as enjoyable to read, right? And I think prophecy ranks near the top of that list of things that we read, and we're like, I really don't enjoy this, right? I think that falls in there with law and genealogy of things like, wow, why, why is this even here in the first place? I think it's kind of past its time. But as we have seen this summer, as we've walked through these minor prophets, that there's a great deal of wisdom and truth that we can find in those books of the Bible that still apply to our lives today. And I think we'll find that, again, it's the case as we look at the book of Zephaniah today. Now, when I was younger and growing up, my single-digit years of my life, most of that was spent in a town called Livonia, Michigan. Now, Livonia, Michigan is a city. Back then, there was about 250,000, but you never hear about it because it's right between two other cities. One of them is called Detroit, Michigan, and the other is called Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, and those kind of get a little bit more notoriety and fame. And if you understand that, then you understand why uh, that I'm a Detroit Lions fan, and I'm also a fan of the national champion Michigan Wolverines. I just had to throw that in there in case I haven't mentioned it recently, that Michigan is the national champions, because um, no one talks about football anymore in the South. I don't know what happened, but Michigan won. So anyway, when, when we were living there, Livonia was known as a pretty safe place. Livonia is still known as one of the safest cities in America, but 45 years ago, wow, somebody's getting old, but it, it was a much even safer place. Uh, we would ride our bikes and our parents didn't care. Like, we would just take off. We would go for miles through town. And, and it was like, oh, yeah, that's just what you do. Uh, there was a park, I remember, that was two miles from our house. And we used to just ride our bikes there and go play at the park and then come back. No big deal. No one worried about you. No one was concerned. You just kind of did that, and it was all good. Um, and so because of that, we tend to have, my older brother and I would tend to have certain patterns that we would go, right? We'd go out ride bikes. We would always kind of go the same routes. But every once in a while, we would decide to have an adventure. And that adventure might be, hey, we haven't pulled down this street in our subdivision before. Let's turn down there and see what's down there. Now, I know cutting edge stuff, right, to pull down the street you haven't been down. But when you're a little kid in your single digits, that was kind of cutthroat. You know, we, we were kind of breaking the norm. And I can remember on one of these adventures, uh, we came across a business that was being built. It was a, kind of a look like a strip mall type thing with maybe three or four bays in it. And uh, I remember there was that orange fencing, that construction fencing all around the job site and it had these big signs that said, danger, do not enter, keep out. Well, for my older brother, that was an invitation to enter, right? And so he convinced me uh, that it was late in the day, nobody was there, there were no workers present, that it would be fine if we went in just to see what was happening construction-wise. And this building was pretty much built on the outside, and so when we got into the building, they were putting up the interior walls, doing all that kind of stuff. So we we're walking around looking in there, no, no big deal, uh, until I hear this voice, and it's not my older brother's voice, but it was a voice that gave me chills 
because the voice that we heard was calling out our names. And that voice happened to be my dad's voice. You see, um, it was getting near dinner time, and we were out riding our bikes. And so my dad hopped in the car and was like, I'll go find them and bring them home. Again, we traveled the same patterns. He wasn't thinking it was that deep. He couldn't find us. He turned down the same street. And apparently, when you sneak into a place that says danger, keep out, don't go in, leaving your bikes on the outside of the fence by the curb is probably not the smartest uh, activity, but that's where we had left our bikes. So dad saw our bikes, and he came, and he got us. Now... Um, there was punishment that followed. And I remember arguing with my dad that it wasn't my fault. I didn't want to go in, but my older brother convinced me and it was his fault that I was there in the first place. Now, if you're a parent, you understand that line of reasoning with your child. And there is some truth in that, right? I was, I was the innocent, precious angel who was convinced by the dark demons to, to follow their way, right? But at the end of the day, I still broke the rule, Right? I had an option to not go in, all that stuff. So my dad punished me, but he didn't punish me as severely as he punished my older brother. Um, And so maybe you found yourself in a similar situation in life where you got in trouble for something you maybe didn't think you really did, right? Like it wasn't really my fault. I was just kind of with everybody else when they got in trouble. One of those situations, right, that, that you were on a team at work and somebody did something really stupid, but because you're on that team, you got in trouble as well, right? Everybody kind of got chewed out for that. Um, yeah, that, that's an old management style, by the way, of everybody's in trouble all the time. And so that was just kind of one of those things that happened. Or, or maybe, you know, one of those, I don't know, you're driving on vacation and everybody's doing 85 miles an hour, so therefore it's okay, right? And the cop chooses you to pull over. And you're like, but everybody else was doing it. And he goes, well, everybody else was wrong too, right? But you get the ticket. So we find ourselves in situations in life where we're like, it's not my fault everybody else is doing it, but we still get in trouble for those things. And that's what we're going to see unfolding today when it comes to the tribe of Judah in the book of Zephaniah. So let's jump in and take a look at this guy and see what Zephaniah has to say. First chapter, first verse says this, the word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. Now, if you've been here at all this summer, many of the prophets we have talked about, we have no clue who they are, right? Like Obadiah. There's like four Obadiahs mentioned in the Bible, and he may not even be one of those. We don't know. We just have to guess. When it comes to Zephaniah, there is no prophet, major or minor, that has more notoriety and more emphasis on who he is and exactly when he preached than Zephaniah. And why was that? Why why is that? And there's some significance in that because we learn a lot about Zephaniah in this one verse. And and I think there's a great reason. If you look through this genealogy listing, right, his daddy's Cush, his granddaddy's Gedaliah, his great granddaddy's Amariah, but his great, great granddaddy is who? Hezekiah. If you were here a couple weeks ago when I preached, we talked about Hezekiah. He was the king of kings, right? We said, when it talks about Hezekiah, it says that there was no king before him or no king after him who did as good in the eyes of the Lord, including David, right? Remember, Hezekiah was the guy who was told, hey, Isaiah came in to his bedroom, was like, hey, uh, I hate to break this to you, you've been a good king, but you're going to die. Prepare your house, get things in order. And Hezekiah rolled over in bed, faced the far wall, and wept bitterly before the Lord. And before Isaiah had left his bedroom, God told Isaiah, hey, turn around and tell Hezekiah, I'm going to give him 40 more years. All right, this is Hezekiah. And Zephaniah is like, I'm with that guy. That, that's my great-great-granddaddy, okay? I, that's how I roll, right? And the cool thing about, uh, about Zephaniah is that he is prophesying during the reign of another king you may have heard of. His name was Josiah. Actually, when you hear people talk about him, they often say, good king Josiah, okay? Because Josiah was another good king, much like Hezekiah was before him. Now, here's the interesting thing. We talked about this with Hezekiah. Even though Hezekiah chased after God, loved God, and obeyed God, not all the people did. And we talk about Hezekiah's goodness wasn't good enough to save the entire nation. He was good, he was responsible for himself, and other people had to follow. We see the same thing happening with Josiah. You may have heard the story of Josiah. If not, I want to recap it for you, okay? Josiah was very young when he became king. And he's doing things, and he's like, hey, 
tells a group of his servants, I need you to go into the storehouse and get some money out of the storehouse, right? So they go into the storehouse to get money out of the storehouse, and while they're there, they find this book, right? And it's, it's kind of a big book. And they're like, hey, we found this book. And on the cover, it says the book of the law, okay? And uh, it just sounds like, well, that, that sounds like it might be important. Let's open up this book of the law and see what it says, right? So they open up the book of the law, and Josiah, as they're reading it, begins to tear his clothes and weep because he realizes, hey, this is the law of Moses. This is the law of God that God gave Moses, right? The first five books of the Bible that we call the Pentateuch. This is what that is. And they had been lost. Y'all, they lost the Bible. Between Hezekiah and Josiah, the people of Israel had lost the Bible, completely forgotten what the word of God had to say. Now listen, most of you growing up, when you went to your grandparents' house, grandma had a Bible on her coffee table, right? Don't know if she ever opened it or not, but you knew where the Bible was, right? You had easy access to the word of God. The people of Israel, the chosen people of God, his children, guess what they did? They lost the Bible. They put it into a closet and forgot all about it until Josiah found it. And Josiah tore his clothes and said, we have got to change. We've got to stop worshiping other gods and we have got to start living for God. Now, same problem we see with Hezekiah. Even the Josiah has a heart for God. Even though Josiah is changing, the people in his kingdom, the people around him have not gotten to that place. And so Zephaniah is like, I'm gonna try to help out. I'm gonna prophesy. I'm gonna start saying some things that need to be taken care of. Now, as we begin to look at the book of Zephaniah, we're gonna find there's three parts to this book. The first part is prophecy against Judah. It's looking at the nation of Israel, this tribe of Judah, and saying, hey, this is what you have done wrong, and this is what God's gonna do about it. In the second part, we're gonna see prophecy against other nations. Remember the story I talked about? I did something wrong, but my big brother convinced me to do it. Well, guess what? The reason the children of Israel were worshiping other gods is because the neighboring countries were, were influencing them and pouring into them and telling them you need to worship these gods too. And so God's gonna go after these other nations. And then like with most of the minor prophets, we're gonna see after these like, here's what's coming, there's hope. And so the very last part of Zephaniah, we're gonna see hope. And that's something I think that we need to grab hold of and look at. So let's continue as we dig into this, all right? The first prophecy piece here is declaring destruction upon Israel for the sins they've made, all right? And what's it cool, if you think about this, as I go to read it, think about the book of Genesis, think about the order of creation, think about what God did in creation, right? Now, let me read you what Zephaniah says. Starting with verse two. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble with the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priest along with the priests. Those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from the following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. Now in there, it mentions two foreign deities. Baal was the God of the Canaanites. And then we have Milcom, who was an Ammonite God. And so you're already seeing this influence of these other nations that they've had. And God is upset. God is mad. And God says, I'm going to wipe you off. Again, going in the Genesis way, I'm going to kill the birds, the beasts. I'm going to take everything off the face of the earth. I'm going to take it back to how it was in the beginning. I'm going to wipe it out, right? Pretty, pretty intense what's going on here, all right? And it's because they've given their worship not to the true God, not to Yahweh, not to the one who's chosen them, but they've given it to all these other gods instead. And then we see in verse 12, it says this, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Look at when he says, I'm going to search the city with lamps, that means he's going to search high and low, intently seek. It's not going to be like a quick glance. Anybody out there? No, he's going to dig into the dark places. He's going to go into every crevice, every little possibility where someone could be hiding and looking for people who he says are complacent. Who are complacent. Ah, oh, no, that ain't going to happen. God's, God's not going to do that. And, you know, he doesn't really help us all that much, but he ain't going to hurt us either. And, and so this is what we see happening here. So Zephaniah in these verses has laid out three different types of people that you can find in Jerusalem. Those who worship false gods, those who worship Yahweh and false gods, 
and those who are complacent towards God who don't think that he actually gets involved in the affairs of men. These are the three types of people that that Zephaniah is calling out. Now, pause here for a second because if we're going to be honest with ourselves, there's times in our lives today that we can find ourselves maybe one of these three categories. There are times in our life, based on the circumstances that face us, that we're not really worshiping God at all. We're, 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 our attention and our desires are somewhere else. We have a false God in our life that we're worshiping. There's times, probably more often in our lives, where we're worshiping God, but we're also worshiping other things. If I were to ask you what's the number one thing in your life, you might give me the Sunday school answer of Jesus, but if I look at your checkbook or look at your calendar, I would find a different answer. They're in a battle. They're in a conflict with each other. And then there's times in our lives when bad things happen, particularly kind of like what Joshua talked about last week, where we wonder if God ever, ever does exist or if God does anything. That we just find ourselves kind of in this complacency of, I don't, I don't, I don't think God really isn't that involved. And there's times in our lives where we go through those seasons based on what we're facing. And Zephaniah would say to you and I the same thing he's saying to them, that's not right. That's not good. And because of that, judgment is coming. Picking back up in verse 13, it says this. Their goods shall be plundered. Talk about the people of Jerusalem. And their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Happy thoughts, right? Awesome. A day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of the wrath of the Lord. In the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Gather together, yes, gather together, O shameless nation, before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land who do those just commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. See, Zephaniah is laying out what's gonna happen. It was funny, a few weeks ago during crest camp, we were kind of walking through the Romans road. And so when you do the Romans road, you have to call out what's sin in people's life. And our story was Samson that day. Right, and we were talking about Samson in our lesson, and I remember teaching about the kids because in the end of Samson, what happens? Spoiler, just in case you haven't read the story, everybody dies, right? The Philistines die, but Samson dies too, and that's how we left our kids on Tuesday. Hey, go home, see your mom and dad. Remember, everybody dies, right? It was kind of this happy thought, and that's what Zephaniah is doing here. Hey, when you sin against God, His judgment is total destruction. I mean that. Four called day of darkness, gloom, like really darkness, really gloomy, really bad place. That's what's coming your way, right? Zephaniah is laying this out. But at the very end of that passage, he flips it and he says, repent. There might be time, all right? It hasn't happened yet. Here's the thing with God. We know this about God. If you've read the story of Jonah, if you listen to Peter's conversations with God, there's always room for God to give mercy and a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, a 1,930,000th chance, all right? There's always a time with God to say, hey, I'm going to repent. And so Zephaniah is saying, there still may be time, repent. Hey, my great granddaddy repented of sins in his life and God gave him 40 more years, right? Josiah is repenting for the nation. Maybe if we go along with Josiah and repent, maybe God will spare us a little bit longer. Repent, he's calling for us to repent against that, right? And then he makes a turn and he begins to address what we call the second part of the book where he begins to address the other nations around Jerusalem. Right, So he's telling Judah to repent, but then he has a message for all of the other ones, the the instigators, if you will, the big brother who says, hey, I know the sign says danger, keep out, but let's go ahead and go in anyway. God's got a message for them too. Here's what we see. For Gaza shall be deserted and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon and Ekron shall be uprooted. 
Woe to you, inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left. And you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze, and in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revelings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and may boast against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. This shall be their lot in return for their pride because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. Now, Zephaniah here, I don't know if you caught this. He's going through all these nations and how God's gonna punish them and utterly destroy them. But he begins to throw in another line in there, a remnant of my people, a remnant of my people. Something interesting happening here, right? He's calling out Canaan. He's calling out Moab. He's calling out Ammon. He's calling out all these nations. I will completely and utterly destroy you. And then the remnant of my people. In other words, what he's going to do to Judah, how he punishes Judah, what we read about before, is not a complete annihilation. There's going to be a remnant left over. And I would argue with you today that remnant is a repentant remnant. The people who listen to Zephaniah, listen to Josiah and say, hey, we were wrong. God, we are sorry. We will follow after you. God's gonna spare them. And after he desolates the world and takes all that over, he's going to give that remnant what's left, those, those places, what's left over. You see, the younger brother didn't get punished as much as the older brother. He has a chance. There's a remnant left that can still do something about it. But those other nations are to be completely wiped up. And so what we see here is that God has this burning anger against idolatry, against violence, against oppression. And all the earth is gonna be consumed because of this sin that it's done against God. But then we see the prophecy take this turn, kind of a surprising turn after all this destruction. And we see that this burning anger, this fire of God, this wrath of God, this this fire, this all-consuming fire that he's talking about is not merely for destruction. You see, fire has another purpose often used in the Bible. And that process, purpose is purification. If you think about when you melt down metal, you're doing that so you can take off the dross, which is the impurities that float to the surface. You see, God's fire, what we're going to see in this passage, it's not just about destruction. God's fire is for purification. It has a deeper purpose. Picking up chapter 3, verse 9, it says this. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed one, shall bring me offerings. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst you proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. You see, the Lord is going to scour the earth and destroy it with fire. He's going to come in and and judge all those nations, all those who have rejected God most high in favor of false gods in their life. Those, Those people who have cheated They've lied, they've stole, they've oppressed others to gain wealth, to oppress others to gain power. They'll be destroyed. 
they were removed so that the faithful, so that the outcast, so that the lowly and the humble, the oppressed can live in safety, can live in peace and fellowship with their loving creator. You see, ultimately what Zephaniah is trying to tell us is this, that apart from Christ, we can expect destruction, devastation, that all-consuming, fiery judgment of God to devour and consume us. You see, God's judgment on Israel was the handing over of the city of Jerusalem. And we read, if you know anything about history, Jerusalem was completely destroyed. Walls torn to the ground. Temple completely destroyed. He totally decimated that city and got rid of it. And they rebuilt it. And then it was burned down again by the Romans. And the temple was completely destroyed. There is no temple today. But here was this hope coming. Because we don't need a temple today because our lives, our bodies are temples to Jesus Christ who is gonna come and fill this. All of this prophecy of Zephaniah will find fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ who comes to restore, who comes to take away that fire and to bring us hope. So understanding this prophecy and kind of reading through a good portion of the book of Zephaniah, like what does that have to do with our lives today, right? What, what is the application for us to take away? I, I think it's bad of me as a pastor to share scripture with you and then not tell you how it can change your life, how, how you can apply it. And it, I don't always hit it out of the park and right, but I think there's about four basic truths in here that we should really grab hold of and apply to our lives today and, and to try to make changes in these areas, all right? The first truth I think we should look for is this, and that's judgment. Now, we don't like that word. We don't like the word judgment, right? I mean, sometimes we like it. If someone does us wrong, we'd love to see them get judged. But the idea of judgment as it applies to our life, we're not big fans of that, right? Because judgment's kind of a call out that we may have done something wrong, that, that we may have not been perfect. And I mean, I'm pretty perfect, right? I mean, how can I mess up, right? And so we run into this dichotomy here. But I think it's because we have this, this wrong sense of what judgment really is. If you remember, Zephaniah was writing this during the king of, reign of King Josiah. He was the last good king of Judah. After him, bad king, bad king, and then annihilation. They're, they're taken hostage, right? And right at the very beginning, he doesn't want us to forget that God is a God of judgment, that God is a God that has wrath. And the biggest issue of the people of Israel was that they always wanted to worship someone other than God. It was this constant struggle. I mean, they had barely gotten out of Egypt. They had just crossed through the Red Sea and they're complaining against God and they go to Aaron when Moses is up on the mountain and what does Aaron do? Bring me your gold so I can make what? Golden calf for you to worship. Like they just walk through an ocean split in two on dry land and they're like, there's no God. We need a new God. All through their history, they're constantly pushing back against God. Then you had the period of the judges. They're pushing back against God, worshiping other gods. Worship, I mean, we talked about last, a uh, couple weeks ago, uh, under the reign of Ahaz in Israel, they were sacrificing children to worship another god, right? I mean, and the whole thing of kingship, of kings of Israel, came because they didn't want God to be their king. They didn't want God to be their god, and they didn't want God to be their king. Their entire history is pushing back on the lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. And there's judgment for that. There's judgment when we choose not to worship God. Today, we face the same issues. Now, I don't think many of you have a golden calf in your backyard, right? I don't think you have an asterisk pole hanging up in your house. But there are plenty of other things that we worship that are way more important to us than God. Too often, we get through our busy weeks, our busy lives, and we don't think about God at all, right? God is a Sunday morning event, we, we, we care about God on Sunday morning from 10.30 to about 11.35. And after that, hey, it's time to go get lunch. And then, hey, next is Monday tomorrow. We got a lot going on, busy week. Oh, it's Sunday again. Let's think about God. But there's lots of things that we put in our lives, the demands and enticements of our culture get so much of our attention. We're seduced by money. We're seduced by what we have. We're seduced by our recognition that people know who I am. We're seduced by our status, our honor. Look at me, look what I've done. Social media has taken that to a whole nother level where it's not about what God's given me, it's what God's given me better than he's given you. 
He said, look at me, look at me, look at me. And we often, even if we don't know it, are giving our worship to other things, thinking that it's okay, thinking that these are God's gifts. Surely he wants us to revel in them. But that's not the case. Ralph Waldo Emerson one time said this, a person will worship something, have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. We all worship something. We are made for worship. We were created to worship. The question is, is what have you put in that place of worship in your life? Because if you worship the wrong thing, God says, I will bring judgment. Judgment is one of those things in your life that it is there to keep you from doing things you shouldn't do. There are many times as a kid growing up, I made the right choice, not because I thought it was the right thing to do, but because I knew if my dad found out and got a hold of that paddle, my life was over, right? And so the fear of judgment made me make the right choices. The fear of judgment, knowing what God says he's gonna do to us, should help us to make the right choices. I have found this in my life, way too late in my life. But if I don't wanna be punished for something, the best way not to be punished for something is not to do the thing that causes you to be punished for the thing that you do, right? If I don't do wrong things, I don't have to worry about getting punished for those things because I didn't do them. But when I do make a mistake, when I do fall short, and when I do fall back, that takes us to the very next thing that Zephaniah wants us to do, and that's repentance. To go before God and to repent. Zephaniah 3, 8 through 10, it says, therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour it upon them my indignation, all my burning anger from the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. It, it reinforces that judgment should bring about repentance. When we understand what God's gonna do, and we understand we went against God, that we should repent. You see, God's judgment is not merely punitive. He gets no enjoyment in punishing us. It was meant for correction, to putting us back on course. Listen, I know that when my dad had to punish my older brother and I for, for breaking those rules, he didn't do it out of fun. He didn't think, yes, I get to punish my kids today. Awesome. As a parent, you know that's true. One of the hardest things as a parent that you do is to have to punish your kids when they do wrong. As a matter of fact, I would argue the lack of punishment of our kids is a big problem in our nation today. I'll say that again. The lack of punishment in our kids is a big problem with our nation today. We have a lot of entitled people who think they're right all the time because no one looked at them and said, you're wrong. In other words, they've never repented of anything in their lives because if I'm not wrong, I don't have to ask forgiveness. Listen, we all make mistakes. And all of us have an opportunity in our life where we need to repent, where we need to say, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. And when you sin against God, you repent to him. Listen, it's for our benefit. Listen, when my dad was punishing me as a kid, he always said, you know, I'm doing this because I love you. And, you know, it hurts me more than it hurts you. No, no, it did not. I promise you, it did not hurt you more than it hurt me because I still can't walk 30 minutes later, right? But in the end, I understand that, yes, it was for my benefit. You see, repentance is an opportunity for every single person to leave a futile life that is facing the fiery anger and wrath of God to living a life that we see in John 10, 10 that has a life to have abundantly, to, to, to be with you, to walk with you, and to give you more. Repentance is a constant stream throughout scripture. And it's a constant attitude that God's people must have. It's also important for those who have not yet followed him that we can show them the way of repentance so they can come to a right relationship with Jesus Christ. The third truth we find in Zephaniah is this, is that pride brings destruction. 
verses 11 and 12 of chapter three. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For them I will remove from your midst, you proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. All the proud will be destroyed. He will do away with all of that. You see, God desires humility. You see, when we consider who he is and we understand who we are in relation to that, we should automatically be humble. The fact that we get to stand before the Lord of hosts, but the fact that we are children of the king, like we should have some sense of like, there he is, here I am, that should bring humility into our lives. No one in here is a self-made man. No one in here is a self-made woman. God made you. God created you. God gave you purpose. God gave you every skill. God gave you everything you have in your life. You didn't do it. You may have been a good steward of it, but that doesn't make you God made you. And so we should have this humble attitude. You see, God wants a relationship with us and he wants to take anything out of our lives that'll cause us to not have a relationship with him. And pride is one of those big things. And pride is such a a, a trap. So we learn to learn how to be humble. C.S. Lewis once said this, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud and the biggest step too. At least nothing whatever can be done before it. If you think you were not conceited, it means that you were very conceited indeed. Right? This is not some kind of new truth, right? See, so it's just calling this out. We've put it different ways. People who have ever heard of AA or been to AA, one of the first things they say, in order to solve a problem, you have to admit you have a problem. In order to fight pride, you have to admit you're prideful. If you don't think you have a problem, if you don't think you're prideful... It's because you're so prideful, you can't even see the pride in your own life. Humility is awareness. Humility is understanding. A humble person knows where he is before God. They know what the pride is in their life. They know what sins are in their life, and they address them, and they deal with them. We must remind ourselves daily that God is God, and we're not. He knows what's best, and we're we're foolish when we rebel against him and think that we actually might know better. It's only when we get that in order that we can move forward. If you keep thinking, hey, in this situation, I know better than God. I can make a better choice than God. I don't need God in this situation. You find yourself right back at the beginning. If you want to move forward, hey, God, I need you. Lord, I need you. Which leads us to our last truth, and that's this, that judgment and repentance yield joy. They're, they're all here so that we can experience the joy of the Lord. Zephaniah 3, 14 and 15 Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Let me say that again. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. Listen, when you, when you look at God's holy standards and what he's put in place for you to follow in your life, And when you understand that when I follow those things, hard as they may be, that goodness and mercy comes with that, that I get to live in the joy of the Lord, I get to live in the shelter of the Most High, doesn't mean that nothing, anything bad will ever happen to you. No, it doesn't mean that. But it means when he gives you a challenge, he gives you a way out. It means that he's there with you in the fire, that he's walking with you, he's carrying you. Will you understand what that looks like? When we've reconciled our lives back to God, we truly have something to rejoice about. When we know that it's not my problem to fix, but God's gonna fix it for me, that, that, that's great. When something bad happens in your life and someone with more experience comes along and fixes that problem for you, that, that's wonderful. If your air conditioner breaks tomorrow and you call the dog catcher to fill your air conditioner, not a good move, right? Who do you call? the AC repair guy, and he fixes it. There's great rejoicing, right? Because he has skills you don't have. He can fix things you can't fix. And that's just your AC. When the AC guy's there fixing your air conditioning, don't ask him to like solve your life problems. He's not qualified for that. But God is. God is. When we go to him and seek him and truly chase after him, great things can step in our place. It's that moment we realize God's protection, power, and presence are in our lives all the time. 
So as we get ready to leave today, I think there's just one big question that we have to deal with as we try to apply these things to our lives, if we look at this book of Zephaniah and try to sort it out, I believe the ultimate question Zephaniah is asking is the same question I'm about to ask you. Will you follow God? Will you follow God? Tomorrow's Monday, right? One of the most dreaded days of the work week. We've had two days off. Some of us a little bit longer because of vacation. We get back on Monday. Woo, right? Will you follow God on Monday when everything seems to be falling apart? Thursdays? Thursdays are kind of rough at work too, right? Like the whole week's been piling up. Friday's a bit of like, I'm going to leave. I'm just going to leave it all to the next Monday, which is awful. But hey, Thursday, you start feeling that weight. You start feeling like there's so much more to be done. I only have a day left to get it done. Will you follow God on a Thursday? School starts back soon. I know, right? <laughs> Parents are like, man, we just started this whole break thing, right? Yeah, it starts back soon. When you go on that last hurrah vacation, which most of you will do, you got to squeeze one more in before we get back to school. On vacation, will you follow God? Will you make choices that honor him? Or you follow yourself and do what you want to do because it's fun and, hey, God will forgive me later, right? Zephaniah is asking us, will you follow God every day of your life? Listen, we're going to make mistakes. I get it. We're going to fail. I do all the time. But it's about repenting. It's about looking back at God and saying, God, I am sorry. God, I will do more. I need, I need you in me. God, help me to follow after you, to chase after you, and to do what you've called me to do. You see, and when we begin to do that, we realize that following God is not a job. It's not a duty or something that we have to do. When you realize who God is and all he's done for you, then following after him becomes a desire. It becomes a delight. It becomes something like, I get to do this. Because God loved me so much, I get to be with him. I get to walk with him. I get to talk to him. I get to have him connect in my life. And when you understand that, your natural response is gratitude, joy, thanksgiving. God, thank you so much. God, you're so good. That's the life he wants for you. Instead of walking on eggshells our whole lives, we can just walk in the freedom of God's grace. Have you ever understood what it means to truly be free? That only comes from following after God each and every day. And that's the message of Zephaniah today.